Hey, evening. It's uh, good that you guys, you know, I'm really pumped about the fact that people give up Tuesdays and Thursday nights to learn about security. Because like I said, when we first started this whole thing, uh, even back in 2010 and same holds true today, we need more of you, right? So hopefully you find your passion in something that we're talking about, you know, in the course of the 13 classes and you'll dedicate yourself to that because we certainly need it in the industry. Uh, yeah. What else I can say? Oh, and then after tonight, you guys realize what's 13 divided by, well, what's four divided by 13? Roughly a third? Hey, numbers matter, man. Well, that too. They both matter. 30.769231% done after tonight. That's pretty cool, though, when you really when you think about it. That's number of classes, not the content, because like I said, we're going to accelerate. Tonight, we've got 70 some odd uh, slides to get through. And I don't know if you guys have read this any of this chapter yet, but it doesn't it seem kind of spotty, like we're like here and then over here and then over here. This is, you know, one of the things that they did when they rearranged the domains. It used to flow a lot nicer. It would fit in its boxes a lot better. So one of the challenges for, I think, anybody taking the exam is just trying to just memorize, right? We're going to talk about some things today. In particular, we talk about some of the security models that are like, I was telling, hey, hey. You, you told your wife I look like somebody from Metallica? Wife. Yeah, I, I love you. I, I love you. <laughs> right? So if the, if, Still hiring? If, well, now we are. Yeah. <laughs> I, need somebody, I need somebody to just follow me around and say, hey. You be confident? Yeah, I sure. <laughs> the hell with the sis. Yeah, I got an ego, too. Yeah, I got an ego, too. So, uh, yeah, so I was telling Matt. I can count the number of times that I've applied the BIBA security model on zero fingers. I can count the number of times I've applied Bella Padula, Clark Wilson, uh, you know, all of these models that we're going to talk about. But the, the, the important thing to remember is the concepts and you have to memorize the stuff. You'll have to force yourself to memorize for the exam because there will be questions on BIBLA and BIBLA and BIBLA. BIBLA and Bella Padula. That's mixing BIBLA and Bella Padula. BIBLA. So it sounds like a nightmare. I'm going to create that one just so we can have another thing to test on that we don't ever use. There's also things, you know, in this exam that are more historical, right? We'll talk about uh, TCSEC, the red book, uh, orange book. Those don't really apply anymore, but the concepts sort of do. So, they test on that. Yeah. They yeah, they will Here test on that, go. which is kind of a bummer because, you know, the red book or orange book, Rainbow Series 83, this is 2017. That's 17, 17, 34 years ago that was passed. So not, it doesn't, but the concepts apply. So anyway, we'll get through all that good stuff. It'll be fun. But that does, that is one of the things I think that makes this a challenge for people is I'm memorizing things that won't apply. The concepts will, but the, you know, as they're written, they won't apply. Uh, last, on Tuesday, these are the things that we talked about. We talked about classifying uh, data the importance of that, uh, ownership of data, different types of ownership, memory and remnants, data destruction, and uh, determining data security <laughs> controls based on typically standards. So we talked about all that stuff on Tuesday. Any questions? I mean, what, anything we covered on Tuesday? No, piece of cake. Quiz, let's do it. What type of memory is often used for CPU registers? You remember the memory on CPU, on the CPU, cache? Level one, level two cache. What kind of memory is that? Is that dynamic RAM firmware, uh, read-only memory, or static RAM? Static. static. That's good to me. What type of firmware uh, is, hey, a new person. Nice. Welcome. Find a seat. You get to sit up front. But I'm not going to, uh, <clears throat> I'm a pretty, I don't like lisp and spit. Can we talk? So. You'd be in trouble, but you're on my good list right oh, okay. now. It's like the teacher's, you're, like the, you're like the teacher's pet now, man. That's sweet when your wife told me that. Like, yeah. I'm a big Metallica fan, too. You That's, see it, don't you? Yeah. 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 I'm also a biker, too, so that's pretty cool. One of these days I'll come in. That's what I'll do next time. Every time I come in here, change a little different. Or like a tank top. 
So we show off the tats. You got your Halloween costume set up for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what type of firmware is used to is is erased by ultraviolet light? Uh, so flash memory is not. Prom is also not programmable. Read only memory. That's in the we've seen that field pro programmable devices. Do you remember that? Uh, so it's going to be EEPROM or it's going to be EEPROM. EEPROM is elect. So the key first E in EEPROM is electric. It's not ultraviolet light. So the answer is A. Yeah. Two for two. Uh, what describes the process of determining which portions of a standard will be employed by an organization? So this is, there's two different kind of definitions, sort of, we talked about on Tuesday for standards, right? There are standards that are policies, guidelines, standards, procedures, right? We know that standards are mandatory, typically technology specific and kind of all that stuff. But then there's also the standard, like an international standard, like a picture on the box, how, you know, like ISO or COBIT. Uh, those are also standards. So this is referring to the latter, not the former of those two. Uh, so what process? Uh, baselines and policies. A baseline would be a standard if we were talking that kind of standard. Uh, policies are not standards. So you can eliminate A and B. <clears throat> this is pretty typical in the test, right? You can eliminate two off the bat and then it's which one I can't remember. What is it? In this case, it's uh, what portions. So the keyword is portions would be scoping as opposed to tailoring. Uh, what non-volatile <clears throat> memory normally stores the operating system kernel on an IBM PC compatible system? Uh, disk is a, a form of non-volatile memory. Uh, firmware is also <clears throat> sort of non-volatile memory. Uh, it's what's written to a ROM. So ROM is also non-volatile. So the other one here that's volatile is C, RAM. That requires you know us to refresh power or have a power supply uh, but where is the operating system kernel well, we're going to talk more about this today too the operating system kernel is stored on the disk right so when the in the boot sequence you, know, you go through the post then it looks for uh, the master boot record and then the master boot record will load the kernel uh, disk is the right answer here so far, so good. Yeah, any questions on anything we've covered so far? Nothing online, we're good, all right. right? Yeah. Uh, what is the ISO, what was the ISO? Remember I went through this thing, right? Not to confuse you. Uh, so ISO used to be BS7799, but that's not what the question's asking. The question is what did ISO 17799 become? So it was BS7799, then it was ISO 17799, then it became ISO 27002, 2005. That's the right answer. Yeah? 27001 is, you know, so that whole series, there's no 27000, that's a series. Uh, 27001 is kind of defines the scope and what is going to be in scope for certification of an ISO system. And 27002 is the management techniques. That's how you apply controls, essentially. So which of the following describes uh, the duty of a data owner? They patch systems. That sounds like a custodian job. Report sus suspicious activity. That sounds like a user job. So I would eliminate A and B right off the bat. Remember, we have those three roles, owner, custodian, user. Uh, ensure their files are backed up. That could be. I mean, I would expect the data owner to tell me what, what files need to be backed up, but not necessarily ensure that they're being backed up. Uh, ensure the data has proper security levels. That sounds better than C. I think, and this is, again, kind of the questions you'll get, because in practice, C and D are really kind of both sort of data owner responsibilities. I guess at the end of the day, you document them, so in real life, but D is the better answer here. Do you agree? <coughs> Which control framework has 34 processes across four domains? COSO, we didn't talk about COSO. Did we talk about COSO? Okay, then we won't. COBIT, uh, ITIL, and Octave. Octave has the three phases, so it's not that one. ITIL has, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but it's like eight-ish, six-ish, eight-ish, something like that. Uh, COBIT has the 34 across four domains, so B is, B is the right answer. 
Octave, do you remember Octave? Now this one requires us to memorize what those uh, phases were. Identifying vulnerabilities and evaluating safeguards happens at phase two. Phase three is the risk analysis. Uh, so phase two is the right answer for that one. So far, so good. We are all eight for eight, I assume. We are so going to we are going to kick ass on this test. Can I say ass? Is that okay to say? Yeah. I'm a, gonna do you see this? <laughs> right? This is my ticket to that word. Where's HR? HR? <clears throat> I ask HR sometimes stuff and they, 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 tell, they tell me what. When he asks HR right. It's not HR that I need to ask, it's legal. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. So which of the following is the best method for securely removing data from a solid state drive? Do you remember this one? Uh, a is the answer, but uh, bit level overwrite doesn't work. That's That would require uh, sectors on a hard drive. That's a hard drive type. Uh, uh, well, and it says not physically damaged too, okay. Uh, bit level overwrite would be a hard disk. Uh, degaussing would also be a hard drive, a physical spinning type of hard drive, and file shredding doesn't apply, so A is the answer. The release of what type of classified data could lead to exceptionally grave damage to national security? It's not Hillary Clinton's email server, although that might fit. Uh, confidential secret, secret but unclassified, SBU or top secret. Those are all real classifications. I don't think confidential is in the government, but the answer here is top secret. A uh, company outsources payroll services to a third-party company. Which of the following roles most likely applies to the third-party payroll company? And this is another memorization thing. Uh, in, in, in real life, we wouldn't get this granular because we have trouble enough getting into the bigger buckets, you know, the higher level buckets. Uh, but are they a data controller? They don't control the data, so no. Data hander? Does this say hander? Yeah. I don't know what a data hander is. Uh, data owner, they're not the data owner. They are sort of a custodian. I, I would assume that these are, uh, this is a data processor. They're taking the data, data, they're processing it, they're using it on our behalf. Uh, which managerial role is responsible for the actual computers that house data, including the system of hardware, security of hardware and software configurations? Uh, it's, it's not really a custodian because uh, it's a system, they're looking for the responsible for the, for the whole thing as a whole. It, the actual answer is a system owner. Uh, the mission owner, much higher level, that might be uh, something like a business process owner or a business owner, sometimes those are interchangeable. The data owner is responsible for the data, not necessarily the systems that it rides on. So best answer here is D. What method destroys the integrity of magnetic data? So destroying integrity, integ integrity, integrity of the media itself, that, that immediately should trigger degaussing, <clears throat> right? Because that's how it works. Uh, but let's read the rest of the questions, such as tapes or disk drives by exposing them to strong magnetic field while still just justifying that. Destroying the integrity of the media and the data it contains, this is degaussing. It's, that's sort of the definition or degaussing, however people say it. What type of relatively expensive and fast memory uses small latches called flip-flops to store bits? DRAM, dynamic RAM, uh, EEPROM, uh, SRAM, uh, and SSD. Uh, so for the flip-flops, it's gonna be either DRAM or SRAM. One uses flip-flops and one uses capacitors. Uh, this is actually static RAM, right? And capacitors. Okay, there you go. DRAM. Bam! Looks good. Especially being on a diet. I'd like to have me some of that. All right. Any questions? Some new stuff. This is from sort of last year. Uh, you know, just some kind of some current events related to asset security and breaches and those kinds of things for your information. Okay, so this is what we're going to get into today. We talk about security engineering, which is kind of a, I mean, every time you use the word engineer, it seems to apply to like so many different things. 
like, you know, we used to call ourselves systems engineer. You think that we actually engineered a system. So engineering is kind of a loose term that applies to a lot of different things. And that kind of leads to a lot of the spottiness, I think, of this particular domain. It's kind of all over the place. This is one domain where, you know, maybe you need to read it two, three times and it, <clears throat> and it's really going to come down to memorization in this domain. It, like I said, practicality wise, we don't use a lot of these models. We don't do a lot of this work. Uh, it's a lot of it's obsolete, but the concepts still apply. Uh, yeah. And so for the exam, you'll just have to memorize it. So security models, we'll talk about all of those evaluation methods, certifications. That's where we're going to talk about TCSEC, ITSEC, common criteria. Uh, you'll have to just memorize again. A secure system design concepts that is practical that is you know actually how systems are you know it's kind of current even it's just a foundational stuff things haven't changed much there uh, same with secure uh, hardware architecture now the thing that makes it kind of a challenge is none of us are really working with that I mean, none of us are writing uh that type of code none of us are writing um i can't even think of that code right now uh, but we're not working there right so that makes it hard uh, so it requires memorization. Secure operating system, system architecture, virtualization, distributed system, system vulnerability threats and countermeasures. Like I said, these used to be separate domains. So we had security architecture, which would cover a number of these. There's a little bit of physical security sprinkled in. And then in this domain is also cryptography. And we're leaving off today right kind of at that point. We're not going to talk about cryptography because there's enough content there for us to spend an entire class on it, right? So I'm trying to kind of break it up by what we can digest. So objects, subjects and objects, right? You'll see some of this, you know, as we continue through the class too, right? It, we've already covered subjects and objects. I know what an object is. An object's an inactive thing. Uh, a subject is something that, the key there is that it's active, right? Subjects access objects. Subjects manipulate objects. Uh, so that still applies. So subjects are typically, uh, in, in most cases when we're talking about access controls, it's, it's the user. Uh, and the object is the resource, the file, the, the application, the executable, the DLL, the temp file, the whatever, right? That's the, that's the object. <clears throat> so what they're allowed, what they're permitted to do with the system is what the framework is. That's the model. Uh, managing relationships between subjects and objects, understanding read up, write, uh, read down. Usually I'll do this on a whiteboard because for the word read, substitute, you know, think confidentiality, right? Read is confident. When you think write, think integrity. So if I'm protecting against reads, I'm protecting against confidentiality. If I'm protecting against uh, rights, I'm protecting against integrity. And you always have to think of which way I'm going with that read or write access. And that'll tell you whether this is a confidentiality model or if it's an integrity model. I'm trying to protect confidentiality or integrity, right? So try to think it. And even on the exam, putting the boxes, you know, read up, write down will help you. I'll also give you a tip when we talk about Bella Pagel and Biba. Biba has an I in it. It's an integrity model. Those two are essentially converse of each other. Bella Pagel is a confidentiality model. Biba is an integrity model. Easy way to remember, Biba has an I. Where were you when I was studying? Oh, is, is that harder? <laughs> that would have been so much easier. Oh, yeah. I that way. I was like, That's a great hit. Yeah. Well, because you never used it, right? You have oh. to figure out some way. Uh, so the relationship between the subject and the object is kind of <laughs> what the model is meant to, to manage. So if you look at this first one, we have a top secret subject. They are permitted to read down, but they can't, uh, subject reads down, data flows up, right? So they can read down, Is that a, that's a confidentiality model, right? They can't read up, right? It's not really, and, and chances are where I can read up, I can write down, right? This other one, subject writes up, data flows up, that's, uh, that's also actually a confidentiality model because if I can write up, that could violate the integrity of the data at a classification that's higher than mine. Does that make sense? I kind of interpret those two pictures. You'll get better at it as you practice it more, but it's a good, it's a good thing to practice. It will, I would assume it's going to be on the exam. It's been there forever. Yeah. 
we'll, we'll, and we'll get more into it. So that's fine if it, if it doesn't make sense right now. Uh, read, if, as you read the book and we talk about it more, it'll, it'll sink in. So really the types of models, these are the four major kind of types, things kind of fit in them. So this is really how you apply the model, not so much the model itself. Uh, so discretionary access control, that's what we're all used to. That's where, you know, I'm an owner of a file. You know, I can right click and select, you know, properties and assign permissions to somebody else, right? It's discretionary. It's based on, you know, the role, the rights and privileges that I have with that portion of the system or the file itself, right? So it's discretionary. That's easy to remember. Then that's what we see all the time. That's, when, that's how Windows works. That's how Linux works. It's a discretionary access control model. Uh, defined in TCSEC, so TCSEC is part of the Orange Book, which we're going to get into more, written in 1983, so old, but the concept still applies. Way of restricting access to objects based on the identity of subjects and or groups for which they belong. So the group permission. Now, where it gets kind of funny is when we talk about role-based access control. These two kind of marry, because what we typically do, or what a lot of people do when they assign permissions, they do what's called role-based access control. So they put, they create groups, and that group is assigned permissions based on the role of the group, right? And then I plop users into that group, and then they automatically assume the rights and privileges and permissions of that role, right? Sort of the same, uh, sort of the same model, but a little bit different. The thing that's different about role-based access control is the formalization of the actual roles and it's enforced by the system, not the user. So there's a little distinction between those two. Does that make sense? Do you guys have any questions on that? This is how I sign permissions to things. Discretionary access control, it's not controlled by a centralized authority. It's really distributed amongst people that have the right permissions. Mandatory access control, it doesn't matter if I own this this file or not. It's mandatory. It's enforced by the system. It's set up by the system administrator or the security administrator. Right? That's a non-discretionary access control. It's a mandatory access control. Uh, type of access control, the operating system constrains the ability. And we're going to talk today about there's a certain portion of the operating system that enforces that. It's called the reference monitor. The reference monitor is part of the kernel. Okay? So... That may not mean anything now, but we're going to cover that again later on. That's the part that actually enforces when it says operating system. It's the reference monitor, which is part of the kernel that enforces that whole ability. Uh, authorization will enforce by the operating system kernel. Security policy is centrally con controlled by the security policy administrator. There's no discretion here. Right? See the difference between those two. Rule-based access control really is more based usually around permissions and what I can do with objects. But access is allowed or denied based on a set of rules defined by the system administrator. Really good rule-based access control, just way that you know I kind of remember it, is an access control list on a router, right? There's a rule, either you meet that rule or you don't meet that rule. It's not uh, time-based access control. It's also rule-based access control. So I may set up, you know, uh, users can access this system from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. After 5 p.m., the rules change. Right, that's a rule-based type of access control. Any questions on that? Exciting as heck. I'll say you absolutely have to know the difference in these. Mm -hmm. And since I took the test, I haven't thought about them once. Mm -hmm. Right, reference monitor and all that. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I haven't thought about that since I finished studying it. Right. So you got to know it, but right. Don't, yeah, don't and it. so much of it depends. So. You know, for the people online, uh, what Brad was saying is uh, you absolutely need to know this for the exam. Uh, however, in real life, you don't ever use it, right? No. And it kind of depends on what your job is in information yeah. security, too. I mean, if you are an incident responder and a big part of your job is forensics, knowing how the kernel works and being able to find, because you'll see that when we get, you know, to how a system boots, you can see where you could potentially inject code your malicious code to make something happen but where brad and i do most of our work together is it's governance it's policies it's procedures it's it's sort of the boring part of security but it's the really valuable part of security too because it drives everything else so it kind of depends on what you do uh, but you'll need to memorize this and hopefully you know you guys are you guys going 
Uh, do you guys all have access to the slides after class? Okay. Because I think the slides cover 90% of everything you need to, to pass the exam and they should serve as like a, you know, a good reference, you know, as you're doing your kind of your final preparation. All right. Whew. Look at all these. State machine, Bell LaPagula, lattice-based access control. So lattice-based a lot of these other, so some of what to make things more confusing, which we're not going to, but some of these models can fit into other models, right? Bella Pagel and Biba are both lattice based access controls, they're built on least upper bound, uh, greatest uh, lower bound limits, right? Creating that lattice, but we're not going to go, we're not going to go into detail. That I'm going to what we're going to cover is the things that you need to know for the exam, things that you'll need to memorize. Like I said, it's not practical. So a lot of the stuff you can just purge when you're done with the test. <clears throat> State Machine, Bella Pagel, Lattice Space, Biba, Clark Wilson, Information Flow, uh, Brewer and Nash model. I always remember that one because Chinese Wall, uh, that's about a conflict of interest. So I, for some reason, that always Chinese Wall conflict of interest always just seems to kind of, I don't know why. Uh, but Tate Grant model, Access Control Matrix, that's the one where most of us are used to right, is the access control matrix, right? You have basically a table. You have, you know, the columns, I'm sorry, the rows would be the users, the columns would be permissions, and then, you know, that's that model. Easy to understand. Zachman framework for enterprise architecture, so freaking confusing that I would never even, other than memorizing the high level stuff, you know, you can read it if you want to. All these things are freely available. Uh, Graham Denning model, uh, and I always call it that HRU, but it's Harrison Rizzo Ullman because I can never remember their names. So we're going to cover all those. That's the most exciting stuff ever. I tried so hard to make this ex exciting and entertaining for you guys, but some of it, I don't, you just can't do it. I try changing the way I look every day for you guys. I try making jokes, but none of it. So state machine model. Uh, so the thing about state machine, machine, the state machine model at a high level is I have a certain state of a machine and I validate that that state is secure, right? So I have a secure start and then I have, if every one of my transitions are validated to also be secure, then the end result will also be secure, right? That's sort of how the state machine. So the machine tra transforms from state to state and those transforms are all secure, right? So it's just secure, transform, secure, you know. But I only validate it, the model, really, at the beginning. So captured, so the state of the machine, at first, at the very beginning, is captured in order to ver verify that the security of the system, the system is operating way, uh, and actually, conceptually, this is a really good thing. I always think of this with like, um, if I were to gonna, if I were going to create a secure configuration standard, right, going back to Tuesday, where I have policies, procedures, I'm sorry, policies, guidelines, standards, procedures. A standard might be a secure configuration standard, right? So all my domain controllers need to be configured according to these requirements. It's not the step-by-step, -step, so it's not procedures, but these are the requirements. One of the things that we just briefly went through last week, where I can get those benchmarks or those standards, you know, I could go to the government and get STIGs, Stigs, I can't remember what Stigs stand for, S-T-I-G-S. You can go online and Google it and you'll find it. The other one is CIS. CIS is the Center for Internet Security. It has a nice set of baseline benchmark standards that I could reference. I wouldn't take them, apply them exactly, right, because you're going to take down systems and then you'll be out of a job. But what I do do is I tailor those, right? So going back to, again, the last week, I would tailor them to fit my environment and I'd apply those. So where the state machine model to me conceptually makes sense is I start with a, a secure standard, a baseline. Anything that deviates from that standard should have a change control ticket associated with it, right? So the change control ticket would be that transform or the transition is what they call it. And then my validation at the end would also be the secure state. Does that make sense? Because Ideally, in a real, in a perfect world for security, I would have a record of all changes to my environment because I validated that it was secure at one point in time. Any changes to those systems should also be secure so that I have some assurance that the system remains secure going forward, right? 
Does that make sense? You'll have to because you lack trust in the transforms. Yeah. yeah if you if you had a, if you if you were truly able to apply this the concepts here, uh, it doesn't it doesn't sound business friendly. But if you could truly apply these business concepts, I would have I would have to audit a lot less. But the fact that there are so many gaps in the process is I have to audit a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so state consists of all current permissions, all current instances of subjects accessing, accessing objects. If the subject can access objects only by means that are concurrent with the policy, the system is secure. Right? So if only if people only made if people only did their jobs. Right? If, I've been asked by executive management and boards of directors before, Evan, what's the number one thing I can do to you know to improve security? And I, it's the same answer every time. It's fire everybody. And they're like, we can't do that. I know. I know you can't, but that's it. Because if people would only follow the policy, if people would only follow the rules, follow the requirements, follow the process, but people don't do that because they're analog. We're going to talk about that too when we talk about you know the technology part of security. Computers are easy to secure because it's ones and zeros. It's on or off, right? So I can secure a computer as soon as I introduce a person into that, which is an analog. That's how they, they're never on or off. They're always gray somewhere. So anyway. The point here, if a subject can access objects only by means, so subject to people, people could only access objects by means that were concurrent with the policy, the system would remain secure in this model. The problem is that that doesn't hold true. So always secure no matter what state it's in. We start with the finite state machine, uh, state transitions, and then the secure state machine. This is the basis for a lot of these other security models, including kind of what I was just talking about. Do you see how the concept applies? Did that make sense or did I ramble or both? Okay, probably did both. Not a lively crowd tonight. Let's pump up some music in here or something. Get some dancing going on. I don't know. You don't want me dancing. Bella Padula. So Bella Padula is a confidentiality model. Uh, in the way, again, I, I memorized that. Bella Padula doesn't have the I in it. Bella Padula and Biba are probably the two most testable for the exam. Uh, and they're kind of different uh, opposites of each other. So Bella Padula is a confidentiality. Biba has the I in it, it's integrity. <clears throat> two access rules for Bella Padula, the simple security, you will have to memorize this. It will be on the exam. So simple security property. They're highlighted here. You'll, you'll need to remember what that is. For, for the real world, I have to read it for you because I don't memorize this stuff in the real world, but for the exam, I have to. So security, uh, simple security rule, no read up. So that means if you put it into that diagram again, if I'm a subject, the, the object is up, right? Higher, the labels are applied to objects, clearances are applied to subjects. So I have an object with a top secret label. I'm a user or a subject with a secret clearance, right? So you're restricting me from reading up. That's a confidentiality thing, right? There's something at a higher level that I can't read. That's good. And that also gives you the hint that this is a confidentiality model. Uh, the star, it, that, that the asterisk, is that an asterisk? Is that what you call that? The asterisk is actually a star. So star security property, no write down. That also validates my confidentiality because if I have top secret clearance and I'm accessing top secret data, you don't want me to take that top secret data and write that down to somebody with a lower clearance, right? Do you see the upper bound and lower bound kind of thing to this and how it enforces the confidentiality of the data? Two object lab label rules, so those are access rules. That's governing the arrow, the, the subject accessing objects. The object label itself, the strong weak and weak tranquility property, which basically means I can't change the label while the system's running, while the system is in operation, right? Doesn't so much apply to us in real world, uh, but what it means is I'd have to shift, take the system offline. I'd have to take it off, you know, turn it, turn it off to change the route of production. Weak tranquility property, labels won't change that conflict with other properties. That's Bella Padula. And that's basically all you need to memorize, but you do need to memorize it, okay? 
lattice-based. So bellopagula actually is a lattice-based and so is Biba. But anyway, the, the important thing to remember about lattice-based access controls, uh, they can get very, very complex. Uh, that third bullet is what you'll need to memorize for lattice-based. So if you see least upper bound and greatest lower bound, you're talking about a lattice-based access control. Uh, for every relationship between a subject and an object, there are defined upper and lower access limits implemented by the system based on labels and clearance. Uh, subjects are at least upper bound and greatest, greatest lower bound. So when you get the slides, highlight that. That's the really the biggest part of this slide that you need to memorize. Uh, security lattice model combines multi-level and multilateral security. This is a very uncomplex uh, lattice, right? This is really uh, two clearances and one object, maybe two. So you can imagine if I have thousands of files on a system, how funky the lattice can get. So it is complex, not really used uh, in, in our line of work. So Biba, the opposite of Bella Padula. So developed after Bella Padula focuses on integrity. So in confidentiality, I can't read up and I can't write down, right? So what do you think Bibbit is? It's the opposite. I can't write up and I can't read down, right? So uh, focused on integrity, a lattice. So it is a lattice based on integrity levels. Two primary rules, the simple integrity ax axiom, no read down. Uh, the star, I might have said that wrong, but it, that's what it is. The star integrity uh, axiom, no write up. So it so keeps you in your boundaries and, allow, and keeps the data uh, correct. Any questions on that? Okay. Biba and Bella Padge are the ones that stick out as always kind of the biggest ones uh, for the exam. So, but there are others. Let's not stop here, you guys. Let's keep it going. Let's keep the party going. Uh, Clark Wilson. So it's a real world integrity model, real world meaning uh, it's actually used, but we don't use it. Uh, it's, it's very limited in its applicability. Requires subjects to access objects via programs, so I can't access the object directly. That sort of applies even in an, in a, in an operating system, but it's not talking about operating system here, it's talking about the program itself. Programs have specific limitations to what they can and cannot do with objects. Two primary concepts, well-formed transactions, ability to enforce control over applications comprised of the access control triple user the user itself so that's the subject the transformation procedure and constrained data item uh, and ivps you'll just have to memorize again more of this stuff clark wilson is really focused on uh, separation of duties that's the big part there's actually two parts to it Authorized access and modification only in an authorized manner, which enforces the separation of duties and the transformation procedures. It starts yeah. to sound a lot like something you apply to a database. Yeah, you can apply, you can apply this to a database, but you really it applies to a database would be objects, right? It's a collection of objects, and then you know the application would be the subject, in this case, accessing those objects, right? The important thing about uh, Clark Wilson is it's, it would be enforced through the application. It could also be, I mean, you could say the database management system is an application, but in the truest form is the application itself is written this way. So I wouldn't directly access the database by connecting to 1433 and you know, running SQL queries. I'd have to use the application. So Clark Wilson is about application, <clears throat> authorized access, and uh, segregation of duties. Right, so that thing I had to fly in, that's the important things to memorize. Information flow model. This one actually is pretty self-explanatory, which is nice, uh, but it's how data flows. It needs to be kept in discrete compartments. We talked about compartmentalized. Do you remember on Tuesday, we talked about compartments, keeping data within a compartment, then applying security rules to that compartment. Uh, this fits well with that. It would be from compartment to compartment. Uh, two factors, classification and need to know. Now, need to know applies to information or systems. Do you remember? In, need, the need to know concept. I contrasted that with least privilege. Information, right. And least privilege applies to the system. 
right? Okay. Uh, so subject clearance has to dominate. That sounds pretty Metallica-ish, doesn't it? <laughs> subject clearance has to dominate the object classification, so be a higher level, uh, and the subject security profile must contain one, of the, one or more of the categories listed in the label, which enforces the need to know. This really does play really well in dark. <laughs> Was it me? Did you guys see that too? Yeah. You guys see the blue line? Rob, what are you doing? Oh, he's doing marketing stuff. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know who has access. I didn't even set it up. So we'll it's find fine. out. Also, oh, somebody online is trying. You should restrict that ability. <laughs> <laughs> see? What's that? Somebody Yeah. All right, then. Uh, anyway, information flow. That does add to the enjoyment of the class, I think. Brewer Nash, Chinese Wall, Chinese Wall Conflict of Interest. That's why I highlighted it. Uh, do Bell of Agile and Bell use information flow model? No. No. So, yep. Yeah, yeah. Nope. Those are separate. I mean, it, yeah. Nope. Doesn't. I'm not going to. Confuse it more. Uh, designed to add, avoid conflicts of interest by prohibiting one person, such as a consultant. So this is, and this is where this came from. It was from consultants going from bank to bank to bank, uh, and using information that I learned from one bank and taking it to potentially another bank, right? And then that's a that's a big problem. That's where Brewer and Ash comes from. Access controls can change dynamically depending on the user's previous actions, kind of where they came from, what they've been doing. Uh, a subject can write to an object if and only if the subject cannot read another object that is in a different data set or in the truest where this was developed in a different organization. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's Burr Nash. And we've got more. The non-interference model uh, ensures that actions that take place at a higher level do not affect or interfere with actions that take place at a lower level. Thus, the interference or in, in Interference, and I always get interference and inference uh, messed up. So one attack uh, on a non inter or if there's a lack of enforcement of non-interference or interference is covert channels, and one example would be a temp file, right? So something at a higher classification or a higher security label is using a temp file, and in that temp file, uh, I may not have access to um, the data itself, but I have access to the, the, the temp file. But you see, kind of sit, sometimes see this in like Unix, the world writable directories. Is that, you guys ever, anybody Unix people here? There's world writable directories that are kind of have to be that way. And so you depend on the application to enforce the security of the files in those world writable directories. And a, and a good example is like temp directories, right? Multiple things, multiple people have to have access to the temp directory for the applications to work, right? Because all the applications kind of write to this temp directory. It's set aside for that. Uh, so one covert channel attack is I can't access the file itself, but I can access the temp directory and infer what the file says or does based on what I read in the temp file. That's kind of a one covert channel attack. Does that make sense? Okay. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I violated the policy of the system because I used the system in a way that it wasn't intended, but I didn't violate the model. I violated the interference model, but maybe not the model that was in place. I don't know if I'm making any sense at all, but I'm trying to demonstrate that one really easy, or not as easy anymore, but covert channel uh, attack would be to access world writable directories or directories where multiple things are writing to like a temp file, page file is another great place. You know, there's a lot of things that are being swapped in and out of uh, physical memory. If there wasn't, if the reference monitor didn't do a good job of enforcing security on that page file, then I could get all kinds of data. That's a covert channel attack. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Taking grant. So, you know, this one is also, I, I like these ones where they actually give you names of the models that kind of apply to what they actually do. So take and grant is about, you know, the first two rules or four rules in the take grant model. 
One is take, one is grant, the other is create and remove. Uh, so two rights and occur in every instance of the model take and grant. Uh, yeah, so if you remember for take and grant, that there are four rules and these are what the four rules are, take, grant, create, and remove, you're probably fine for the exam. Here, this is one that we can actually relate to. This is one that we actually uh, use. It actually applies. Commonly used in, in most of our operating systems and applications, the access control matrix. Uh, sometimes they're used interchangeably with an access control list, but an access control list can be applied differently than an access control matrix. An access control list basically is these are the things that get access or don't get access, like in a, like in a router, right? It's just one simple rule. It doesn't break it down by you know the subjects and what they can what they can access. You could take it that way, but they're different. So you can see the subjects in col in the first column, and then the files, and then the, what level of access they have. So the way the operating system would work, the reference monitor would reference the access control ma matrix to determine. So you would attempt access, and it would look at the access control matrix and say, okay, yes, this person has this access, and apply it. Uh, in the simplest sense, that's how access control matrices work. Is matrices the pearl of matrix? I'm very good at this. The Zachman, so look at this. The heck? I warned you that this one is this one gets a little funky. Uh, the key words in the Zachman framework are enterprise architecture. This isn't something you're going to see really anywhere. Uh, not anywhere. Very rarely we see this, but six frameworks for providing information security. The thing about Zachman is what, how, where, who, when, and why. And so you can see that those are my column headers. Uh, and then I've got what we're talking about, you know, the roles on the far left. So it's the roles and then those what, when, when, who, why, where, how things. And I think that's good for Zachman. But wait, there's more Graham Denning model. This, you, you guys are going to have fun memorizing this, right? <laughs> Can feel the migraine on it. Yeah. But when you memorize this stuff and then you pass the exam, that's there's two things I think that are exciting about that. One is uh, I can, um, I don't know, I think like computers too, but uh, one is the just the congratulations that you accomplished something. The two is I can purge memory, <laughs> right? Garbage collection is what we call it in, in computers, and I can garbage collect and free up oh, memory and use it for somebody else. I can look at my kids and say, yes, I remember your name, honey. <laughs> Whereas before that was something else was conflicting with that. Uh, so it defines a set of basic rights in terms of commands that, you know, so the important thing about Graham Denning, uh, you will have to remember that objects, subjects, and rules. So there's our triple. Uh, the objects, subjects, we already know what those are, and rules are pretty self-explanatory. There are eight rules that can be applied. From transfer, grant, read, you know, delete, read, create, destroy, create, uh, and destroy. <clears throat> some are objects, some are subjects. So there's our access rules, our object rules, and our subject rules. Yeah, that's Graham Denning, enough. Uh, Harold Harrison Russo Omen, or I, HRU is a better way uh, to refer to it, I, I guess. Operating system level, security model, integrity of access rights on the system. So not necessarily the act, integrity of the data, itself but integrity of the access rights finite set of procedures available and uh, six primitive operations so uh, Harrison Russo Allman uh, I think the things in, important things to remember for the exam are they it is closely related to the Graham Denning model and there's six primitive operations it's not super duper testable Biba and Bella Padula are more testable. Access control matrix is pretty testable. All these are testable, but you know, don't don't try to be a master of this model or any of the others for that sake. Whew. All right, done with that. That's all the models that we're going to cover, and we're not going to cover them much more. We might cover them, you know, in some of our practice tests that we do later on. So, you know, memorize it. Are you Gopher? Did you went? To, did you go to the U? Okay. I know, right? It's painful to be a Gopher fan. It's painful to be a Minnesota fan of any sort. I mean, I am a Minnesota fan through and through, and through but man, I just I hate, I hate, myself, hate myself for it. The Twins are 3-0 right now. If the wow. season ended today, the 
terms of being the best playoffs. season. In yeah, yeah, I think it is. Nineteen, like two thousand seven was the last time they started out three and zero. I know three and zero. Somebody's got to be the best. Somebody's got to be the best. It's not the Twins. Yep. Yeah. All right. So those are the models. We're through that. Now we're going to talk about modes of operation. So four modes of operation. Uh, the first one is a dedicated uh, system. So there's dedicated, high, compartmented, uh, and mixed or whatever. So dedicated, uh, the, the entire system is dedicated to a label, a classification of data. So only one classification for all of the objects that are on that system, right? That's one rule. Another rule is the subject has to have clearance for, the, for that label, right? So that makes sense. I can't access that. Uh, that system at all unless I have uh, clearance. So if it's a top secret clearance and it's a dedicated system, that's a, that entire system is dedicated to top secret information. So one thing I have to have top secret clearance. The other thing is I have to have a demonstrated uh, need to know. And another thing is I have to have formal access approval. Those are the things that you need to know about a dedicated system. Okay. System high is the next. So then this one, uh, objects will have mixed labels, so I might have top secret and secret uh, all on the same system. The subject has to have a clearance level that it that ex that is at least that of the highest classification, and then I also have to have a need to know. Okay, that's system high, and you'll have to. This is testable. We'll see this on the exam for sure. Uh, compartmented. So this is you now everything's you know nice, neat compartments, and I summarized the subject so you see how the subjects change right the first one the subjects had there were three things i needed to have uh on a dedicated system right i needed to have a clearance level of that the system of the system itself or all the objects on that system i needed to have a formal access approval and i needed to have uh a clearance uh, clearance formal access approval and a need to know right on a system high i have to have a signed nda Clearance for all the information on the system. So uh, I, have to have, I have to have a clearance level for, you know, everything on that system. I have to have formal access approval for some of the objects on the system. So not all of them. Some of the compartments I may not need access to, but I have clearance for it. I just don't have the need to know. Uh, and I have to have uh, also a valid need to know for some of that data, right? So that's... Those are the, what the subjects need to have to access the data in the compartment and system. Does that make sense? So we've got, you see the difference between dedicated system high and now compartmented? All the objects are placed into compartments, but yeah, anyway. And then the other one is multi-level. So system contains objects of varying levels. This is what we're used to if we were to try to enforce, you know, something like this. Subject of varying clearances, clearances can access the system. Uh, the reference monitor, which resides in the kernel, uh, mediates all access, so that's part of the operating system. Uh, mediates access between subjects and objects. These are the rules. All subjects have to have a signed NDA for all of the acts, all the information on the system. Clearance for some of the information. Formal access approval for some, and a valid need to know for some. Do you see the differences between the three, four? Okay. Look at that pretty books. Government should go back to using more pretty colors. They don't do this much anymore, but this is the Rainbow Series. Uh, the two books that you'll need to know for the Rainbow Series, uh, really the only two are orange and red. Uh, orange is TCSEC, um, and then red is TNI. That's the for network stuff. Now, the way we would use, you would have used this, and I don't know if anybody, I'd be really surprised if anybody ever uses this anymore, because I don't even know if you can. Uh, but you can access, they're all still freely available. But what we use these for is to evaluate an IT system. I use it to evaluate a firewall, evaluate an operating system, to see if it uh, would fit or I could use it in, uh, in the environment, you know, based on the security requirements that I've defined for the environment. So uh, like 83, Windows NT was still kind of being used in like the 90s. So Windows NT, was evaluated against TCSEC and its level, the highest level you could get a Windows NT system was a C2 
uh, and that was if you didn't connect it to a network. Having flashbacks to see right? different levels, and you do get tested on those levels. Right, yeah. So C2, I'll get, this is what C2 is. So the reason why is because in a Windows NT system, uh, it's discretionary access control, right? So when you look at C, discretionary protection, I can't get to B, I can't get to mandatory protection. If you remember what mandatory protection is, it, you know, essentially there's no right click select properties and assign permissions to somebody else. You can't do that in a mandatory access control system. Everything is enforced from one central authority for all things in the system. So that's why NT could never get to uh, B or A. Uh, there are very few systems uh, commercially available that would ever fit these. A lot of these are custom built kind of operating systems used for specific environments. Uh, but anyway, developed by the federal government, uh, NSA is there, 83. When is one of the first, and that's probably why it's still referenced on the test. It did provide a basis for kind of all the other evaluation criteria and frameworks. Uh, now used as part of the US government protection profiles, then the international common criteria framework, uh, pieces of it. But you see what, it was used to evaluate products before we put them in the environment. So NT went through this, various flavors, Red Hat, you know, went through this. Uh, back in the day, uh, Novell, went through the evaluations, you know, all those things were part of this. You can download it there. If you want to read it, you don't have to. Uh, what you need to know for the exam is pretty much what's on, you know, what's on the slides. Division D is the lowest form of security. A is the highest, so D is minimal protection. Uh, if you hook a NT system or a Windows system, if you were to use the same criteria again, um, to a network, the highest you could get would be a C1. Take it off the network. It's a C2, potentially, uh, and then mandatory stuff and verified protection is very, very, very secure, specialized. But then we got the Red Book, too. So the Red Book was, is kind of the same type of evaluation criteria, very similar, very similar scoring methods, all of that stuff. Uh, it's just applied to network systems, uh, network devices, uh, whereas the others was operating systems and servers, things like that. If you want all the Rainbow Series, you can go there. Has anybody ever looked at the Rainbow Series before? Are you gonna? Are you going to? Do you think? No, curiosity doesn't have you. Green what? Green well, I got these links because I, I have. Just for curiosity, yeah. I'm like, what in the hell? Dang. Yeah. Like RFCs. Anybody read any RFCs before? Request for comments. It's kind of what governs the internet. Those are some. Of those are pretty interesting reads. You read the April Fool's one? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, those guys had humor. There's no humor in government. They're not really government, sort of. They're contractors. They may, you know might have been contractors. Those guys have humor because they laugh at the government people. Uh, so IT sec. So our, you have TC sec. IT sec is another one used extensively in Europe. This is a European standard. It's not an international standard. Well, not anymore. Uh, but used in Europe, which sort of sped it there, but it was never used in the U.S. Uh, references the orange book, but added functionality, effectiveness, and correctness. That's about all you need to know for IT sec. Uh, nope, there's more. Insurance correctness ratings. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember all this. So the evaluation criteria. So you see, you know, F. Uh, F is, is the sort of the correctness. Um, yeah, if you see that, then you're talking IT sec. TC sec would be the ABCD. Uh, yeah, again, you're not going to use this, but memorize it. Um, additional functionality ratings, high integrity, high availability. I wouldn't memorize this per se, but under, you know, just review it. The common criteria. So this one, this one was the first that kind of really became the the standard right the international standard and it's sort of maybe still used uh, i think it uh the last version of the common criteria was like maybe 2009 something like that so it hasn't been updated uh 
internationally agreed upon standard describing the testing of security IT products. Uh, primary objective, eliminate known vulnerabilities uh, for targets of testing. So uh, reaching a certain certification would allow you to be used in certain environments. These are the things that uh, the terms target of evaluation or TOE, security target, protection profile, and EAL. Difference in TOE and STST is the documentation for the TOE. Um, yeah, the EAL is the scoring, and this is what the scoring looks like. So seven, le seven levels of EALs, F EAL1 functionally tested is the least secure, so that would be the D, you know, in our uh, TCSEC. EAL7, firmly verified, designed, and tested. The most stringent requirements, um, that would be sort of equivalent to an A, maybe, depending on what you did with the TOE and the documentation. So the latest version of the common criteria, 2009, if you want to read that, that's there also. Uh, again, I think what you need to know for the exam is what, what's on the slides. If you want additional information, if it helps you to put it into context, then it's there for you. Right, we're halfway through today's class. So far, so good. All right, you guys hanging in there? Need to need a break or anything? Coffee? I'd, if I were if I were you right now, I'd bring in like a, one of those things that comes on a like a what's that? An IV. An IV. So real real quick, online or in a conversation. Oh, I like conversations. You can study the old Tim domains. There's a bunch of free sites and all of them that I mm -hmm. use for studying. Mm -hmm. I only study the 10 domain. It's the same books. content. It's just how it's organized. So there's a couple of sites that have like free, well, that have free test samples. And then there's another one that I use mm -hmm. that I did a subscription for. I just hammered out 250 yeah. question practice tests. So I don't know if you have it or not, but they were asking online. So I have old versions of, of uh, slides too from the old domains. So yeah, we've been the doing information this. hasn't changed. It's just how they've organized it, right. knowing where in the new domains they kind of fall off. Yeah, and I think the but, the format or the the flow was better before. You know, things seem to fit more logically in the older version. And I think even the exam, the test. I haven't looked at the test exam that goes with this this book. Is there a link in the book that tells you? There's. I know there's the a, one that he had two of free online from the previous version of this book. So I'm assuming there's probably one in there. Yeah, but I think that, uh, can't remember. But, but we're gonna go through that in the last couple of days. So if, you, if you're behind in reading, you know, catch up if you can. A lot of reading, but this is a thin book. I'm not giving you a really like, thick pages. one. Huh? 500, or 500 pages should yeah, have it done. Like should have it done in the yeah. night. Right, so layering, uh, technical folks here, layering, you know the OSI model? Same concept kind of applies here, we're talking about it in, in hardware. Uh, so layering provides some abstraction, some encapsulation, uh, keeps uh, things away, you know, lower level functions and uh, operations hidden from higher level operations, which makes it easier you know, for instance, to write an application. If I'm going to write an application for uh, uh, for a system, now I don't even have to necessarily care about the operating system, but I don't have to write like device drivers for that application. I can write to the device drivers. That's a layer. That's a, that's a layer of abstraction. So it separates hardware and software functionality into modular tiers. There's really two functional layers uh, for, um, we'll talk about rings too in a little bit. Uh, but layers just provide, you know, what's happening at the heart, at the software layer. We don't need to know the low level details of, of, you know, accessing memory addressing, for instance. I can write applications. I don't have to worry about memory addressing. I can let the operating system and the CPU handle that, right? I'm writing at a higher layer. There's abstraction of what's going on at the lower level. Uh, and I would use system calls, you know, for that stuff. So actions that take place at one layer do not directly affect the components of another. This also provides, uh, you know, where that reference monitor resides, controls access to those lower level functions. So for networking types, OSI is an example of layering. We're going to cover that layer later. Uh, anybody, anybody want to try to lay, name off the seven layers of the OSI model for me? Oh, you go the other way. I always go down. 
Please, uh, this, I could go that. Please do not throw the sausage cheese away. Yeah. <laughs> Application yeah. presentation That's session right. transport yeah. network. Yeah. Data link physical. All right. So generic list of security architecture layers, hardware kernel. So the kernel is the sys is is that's the reference monitor. That's the, the key part of the operating system. That's what enforces the security in the operating system. One of the challenges with Windows, uh, you know, going back to Windows NT, the kernel itself had had vulnerabilities. So it didn't really matter what you did with a with a Windows NT system, it was still going to be vulnerable because at the root, at the reference monitor, the kernel level, it was insecure. Uh, but anyway, the kernel system drivers, all that stuff, operating system, uh, and the application. So the kernel is kind of the core part of the operating system. You know, obviously the operating system makes a bunch of calls to other things. Um, so abstraction and complexity is the enemy of security. That's a general rule. So when you look at us, the secure, you know, things can get really complex quick. The more complex things get, the harder they are to secure. Right? There's more moving parts. There's more pieces to it. It's easy to secure a server it's difficult to secure 50 servers and then you have people in different departments so as things get more complex the harder uh, things get to secure unnecessary details are hidden from the user there's a there is a great example in the book about abstraction and how it works the user double clicks the mp3 file and that's essentially all they see right then there's another layer of abstraction um, behind the scenes the mp3 file looks up the app looks up the application associated with it, sends the bits to the media player, they're decoded by the media player, uh, then there's a transformation from that into, you know, from the drivers to the sound card uh, and all that stuff, and then you basically hear music. But the user has no idea all those things are happening uh, behind the scenes. The application has, potentially has no idea that the drivers are, you know, uh, being run behind the scenes, you know, that's the abstraction piece. So security domains, list of subjects. So I always think, I always think of a domain as uh, an area or a, a part of the system that has similar security requirements, similar security rules is, is sort of a domain. Um, so security, and I think I kind of refer to that, groups of subjects and objects with similar security requirements, that's a better way to put it. A uh, list of objects a subject is allowed to access is also a domain, kind of maybe even a, a smaller domain. Uh, the kernel, the central core of the computer's operating system, two modes in kernel. You have kernel mode and user mode. Kernel mode is low-level operations. Uh, that's where the operating system uh, lies. Uh, and then user mode, uh, which is, you know, where most applications reside, the things that I interact with. Uh, so two domains within the kernel, user mode and kernel mode. Uh, they're separated, so an error that happens in user mode shouldn't affect the operation of kernel mode if it does then that's, uh, that's a vulnerability. Operating systems run entirely in kernel mode. Any questions on any of this stuff? Did you guys already know this? Really? So this is like so boring. Well, it is. I mean, it is the way it is. Uh, so the ring model, if you, there are four rings uh, to a CPU, and an, at least an Intel uh, CPU. Ring zero is the kernel, ring one operating system, ring two device drivers, ring three uh, user applications. Windows systems and Linux systems really only use ring zero and ring, and ring three. Uh, so ring zero is kernel mode, ring three is user mode. Uh, there are operating systems, I assume, that will operate at other rings. Hypervisors operate at what we call ring minus one, so negative one. Uh, it just allows, uh, because everything else rides on top of it, right? It's not that it operates at a lower level than a single system, you know, running in kernel mode. It's still the same CPU. It just kind of moves everything up the stack. Does that make sense? So it's referred, that's why it's referred to as, they don't start the numbering at zero. They call it a negative one because everything else still remains the same. It's still zero, one, two, three. Uh, so processes communicate via, uh, between the rings via system calls. System calls are slow. As opposed to so at kernel operations, things running in uh, you know operations that are running within the kernel, you would expect those to be much faster than something than an application accessing the kernel and then making that system call. Uh, ring model abstraction. Anyway, we've covered all that good stuff. Here's a pretty picture. So they get as I get lower 
down into the rings, it's more privileged operations, right? Even to the point of accessing hardware directly. Open and closed systems, easy way to remember this is open systems are, you know, what we, this is an open system, right? It's an open architecture. Uh, I can take, you know, essentially the same types of components and put them in a different case. Uh, I can add different, uh, you know, memory modules made by different manufacturers. Uh, I can create new memory things, I mean, uh, new modules, new pieces of hardware for that, uh, for that system. Apple was, uh, is notoriously closed. It's a closed system. So if I want to create a new piece of hardware for an Apple system, I have to, Apple does that. Now that's changed over the years. It used to be sent all that, right? I could never add anything to my Mac without getting an Apple component. But now, you know, they've opened since the iPhone and the iPads and things like that, you know, now I can create, but I still can't create low level hardware components, right? It's more of an interactivity kind of thing. You know what I mean? Do you see the difference between open and closed systems? Proprietary hardware. System unit. More hardware stuff. It's a motherboard. You guys have seen motherboards before. You know the components of a motherboard, so I won't go too much into that. For the exam and for terminology sake, system unit is the computer case and everything in it. The motherboard is the board with the circuitry that connects everything together. Pretty simple. Uh, computer buses, uh, so we have front side bus, which leads to the North Bridge and then South Bridge. North Bridge is closer to the CPU. Traditionally, things that are closer to the CPU are higher performance, uh, also more critical or what we would call more expensive to the system. So the primary communi communication channel on a system is called a bus. Uh, communication in CPU, memory, IO, you know, all that kind of good stuff all happens through buses, different types of buses. In this particular diagram, we have front side bus going to North Bridge, uh, memory bus, ATA or IDE bus going to maybe hard drives, ISA, PCA, ISA. We don't see ISA anymore, do we? <laughs> An AGP. Those are buses. Uh, Northbridge, also called the memory controller hub, connects the CPU to the RAM, very high speed. Uh, Southbridge, IO. You guys already know this? You'll have to know it for the exam, too. If you, you don't. Need, you don't need to know the difference between the two. Yeah, you'll need to know this for the exam. I I know it, but I'm not an expert in this, right? I don't work here, but you have to kind of do the same thing. So the CPU, if you don't know what a CPU is, it's it's everything goes through the CPU. It's the brains. Uh, everything a computer does is mathematical, which is what makes computers, I think, beautiful. They're very predictable. Nothing happen, happens randomly on a computer. Yeah. Did you say that the questions are all straight questions with multiple choice? All of them? No. Or did they now do the model? There's also drag and drops. Yeah. There's also drag and drop questions. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's also the cool thing about, you know, like an incident response. You know, something happens, you know, on the system that seems, you know, innocent and random. It's not random. Something caused whatever you saw on the system to do what it did. Uh, so it's just... I don't know. That's why I like computers so much. They're just predictable. Uh, so clock cycles, there's four steps. That's called the fetch and execute, right? We'll talk about that. Uh, well, there's fetch, decode, execute, and write. Uh, but those are the four cycles. Those four, those four ex not cycles, those four uh, instructions make up a cycle. Right? So those four instructions, those four things happen 2.4 billion times a second a 2.4 gigahertz processor. That's pretty freaking phenomenal, right? 2.4 billion times. Is that then times four for quad core. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's gonna hurt. Isn't that crazy? Yes, that'd be 9.6 billion cycles per second. Yeah. So on the CPU itself, you've got ALU and C and the, and that control unit. Now the control unit is like the traffic cop. Right, it's it's controlling timing. Uh, it's determining, you know, uh, it's doing time slicing, multiplexing stuff like that. The ALU does the actual mathematical calculations, which are really, really very simple. So when you're writing code at this level, it's very simple code, but it's got to be right also. 
there's different types of uh, CPUs. We'll talk about risk and uh, you know that stuff. But here's the four cycles of a CPU. So starting the bottom left, it's fetch, decode, execute, uh, store. That's how that works. So those four things make up uh, one cycle. Just crazy. Pipelining, the concept between pipelining. So in a normal serial processing uh, environment, uh, you can see that's what we see on top, the non-pipeline. So I would go through the four steps before taking the next instruction to run through the four steps. Whereas in pipeline, when I've moved something from fetch to decode, I'm fetching the next instruction, right? That's what pipelining is. So uh, it's it's just a more um, efficient you know method to process. So pipelining combines multiple steps into combined processes simultaneously, fetch, decode, execute, and write steps. Uh, each part is called the pipeline stage. You see how that works, pipelining? Pretty simple. Interrupts, so interrupts are sometimes bad, right? Because they stop the CPU from doing what it was currently doing to pass it. So it'll basically, and the control unit is what does this. It, basically stops what you're doing, writes it, saves it off, and then takes your request, goes through the cycles until that's completed, and then you know picks up again where it left off. But it causes the CPU to stop processing its current state, save the task, and process the new request, and then bring it back up again. Typically hardware-related, most interrupts are hardware interrupts. Questions on that? Pretty basic stuff. <clears throat> So CPU, a process, so these you'll need to memorize too, you know, uh, the difference between a lightweight process and a heavyweight process, and the difference between a process and a thread. Uh, the process, executable program, has data loaded and running in memory. Uh, processes spawn threads, uh, call the light, well, maybe. Uh, so lightweight process, a child process, where one process has spawned another process. A heavyweight process is called the task. A big, big advantage for threads is that they can share memory. Processes don't share memory. Threads share memory that belong to the same process, right? There's some process states. So new, new process is being created, ready. It's waiting to be executed by the CPU. Uh, it's running, it's blocked, terminated. The zombie uh, is a process where the parent has been terminated, uh, but the thread's still all left by itself. So it's, it's a sad state. Uh, right? See how that can be sad? We have a zombie. It doesn't take long for it to be collected. The operating system would handle that. Uh, so multitasking, multiprocessing, multi... So these will need to know the difference, and they're pretty self-explanatory, right? If you think through what the word means. So multitasking is one processor. Uh, multiple tasks are happening simultaneously. One way you can do that is uh, pipelining. Uh, so heavyweight processes, that's multitasking. Multiprocessing means multiprocessors, processing. Two types of multiprocessors, symmetric and asymmetric. The difference between the two is you have the operating system managing the CPUs, uh, or it's one operating system per CPU. That's the difference between symmetric and asymmetric multiprocessing. Multiprogramming, multiple programs running on one CPU, and multi-threading multiple threads or lightweight processes running on it's one CPU. Right? When we get into the security stuff, please, right? I don't want to do hardware stuff anymore. We're covering it because it's on the exam. We have to get through it. So CPU, watchdog timer. So watchdog timers basically recover the system, you know, after something bad, really uh, something bad happened. Difference in complex instruction set computers and reduced instruction set computers. Uh, the, C, the, the CPU in a, in a reduced instruction set computer is specifically designed to, to do specific instructions for its purpose, right? Uh, like a, like a, like a, I don't know, a Cisco router. It's a reduced instruction set computer, right? It's not, it's not built to do all kinds of different instructions like say my laptop, right? That's more of a complex instruction set computer. Higher performance because I've got less instructions to, you know, to go through. All right, so memory protection, preventing processes from accessing memory. Now, this is this is could be a memory or a, a security issue. We're not going to talk about 
attacks on memory now, but we will talk about that later when we talk about, you know, smash the stack and, you know, different types of attacks against memory. But memory protection is a really big deal because if there's a, especially on multi-user systems, uh, you know, I may have different privileges and rights than Matt does on the computer system. And if we haven't, if, if the, and it's, it's kind of a shared responsibility really, but if the kernel slash and, and or you know, application isn't providing adequate memory protection, I could smash the stack and potentially read the memory of what you're doing and even insert my own code into, you know, the memory space of what, of what you're currently doing. So when your application goes to call back from memory again, it's going to call my code, execute my code, and then compromise the system. So memory protection is a big deal, you know, from a kind of a security perspective. Printing processes from accessing memory space belonging to another memory protection is required for multi-user systems. Process isolation, uh, two ways to kind of do process, well, lots of ways to do process isolation, but one way is you can just use uh, separate hardware. The logical control that attempts to prevent when you see logical control, it's it's using the same hardware. Uh, that attempts to prevent one process from interfering with another. Capsulation, black box, time multiplexing. Multiplexing is really taking uh, multiple things and combining them into one. Uh, so multiple processes with a dedicated slice of time. That time multiplexing would be taking all these calls and based on the dedicated time slice for each call, uh, or I would assign a dedicated time slice so I could run multiple threads at the same time. Does that make sense? All right. Um, other things, hardware. So that's whenever you can do hardware segmentation, that's always the most secure, you know, because uh, I'm not that I'm not reliant on code to protect the protect things. Uh, so memory, other memory protection things, preventing process maxing memory space belonging to another. We've covered that. Memory protection is required for multi-user systems. Is this the same slide? Almost seems like it. Virtual memory. Uh, virtual memory. Uh, yeah. Any questions on this? I feel like I keep covering the same stuff. I'm running out of gas myself. This is so exciting. See, those two things are the same. Right? Memory protection. We talked about those two things. That's why when I was reading it again, I was like, I said this already. <laughs> All right. Swapping and paging is taking things, you know, out of, uh, out of one memory space and putting them into another and then swapping them back and forth. Uh, oftentimes it's on a hard drive, right? Uh, that's page faults. The kernel's accessing memory and swap space. That's a, that's called the page fault. So it's not found in, uh, it's originally it's original memory address. It's found in the swap. It's a page fault. BIOS, basic input output system, right? When I start up a computer, we talked about BIOS before, right? What kind of memory is that? <clears throat> ROM, huh? Could be e, e, could be EEPROM. Yeah, it would be EEPROM in most cases, right? Electronically erasable, programmable. Read-only memory. Hey. All right. Yeah, BIOS is typically EEPROM. Firmware is there. So when I start up the computer, that's where things go uh, right away. First thing it does is runs that post. That's kind of to make sure all the hardware components are operating the way they're intended to. Uh, and it does that through a number of ways, but electrical signals is a lot, you know, making sure that all the things are there. Then the next thing it does is tries to find the boot sector, right? Boot sector is stored typically in the first sector of the hard drive. Uh, that's where it contains the machine code to find the kernel and then load the kernel. And then once the kernel loads, then the operating system is loaded. This is pretty easy, All right? So the PC is turned on, the BIOS initializes the hardware, BIOS calls code stored in the MBR, start at the disk zero. Uh, MBR loads codes from the boot sector of the active partition, and then we load the file, you know, load the kernel, load the file system. In general, MBR, 512 or more bytes located in the first sector of the drive. It could, be, uh, it could be held elsewhere. This stuff isn't all that big a deal to memorize. So, I mean, it is good to memorize. Uh, but it becomes a bigger issue when you're talking about, you know, root kits and, you know, things like that. Uh, and where I could potentially compromise the boot of a system. This is this is a big deal. Like, uh, that's why we like pre-boot authentication for... Uh, 
full disk encryption, right? Because it's going to load that. It replaces the master boot record with uh, the, the pre-boot authentication sequence. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? As opposed to just encrypting the hard drive without encrypt, you know, because then I could still, that's how we kind of, you know, um, uh, boot to a flash drive and replaced maybe the master boot record, right? You look skeptical at me. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? No. Okay. You don't know what I'm saying? Bummer. Oh, yeah, pre-built authentication. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. Well, we'll talk, we'll talk about that later. Uh, worm storage. So worm, write once, read many, right? CDs, DVDs, things like that. Uh, now there's rewritables and so you don't run into worm storage very much. Usually it'd be this like a big storage array, storage library, and it's archive. I'm not accessing it probably ever again, but if I had to, it's it's there. Uh, so high integrity of information. It's got a higher shelf life than tapes, but not people aren't using tapes either, so or much less. It's just like banks, like, uh, banks, like yeah. Images, stuff like that. that they get written once and then they never will be modified. Right. Yep. And law firms are using these a lot too, still. So TPM. Uh, TPM is an international standard. So TPM chips, you guys have heard of TPM chips. Two things that that really provides is hardware integrity uh, and uh, encryption. Right. It offloads the encryption of the hard drive to a dedicated hardware module. Uh, so I don't have any performance hit, you know, when I'm doing full disk encryption. So processor, processor that can provide additional security capabilities in hardware, usually on the motherboard. Hardware-based encryption, so it is super fast. Boot integrity is also nice because um, hardware integrity is insured with TPM. Platform integrity and, and uh, disk encryption. That's good to know for TPM. Just a tidbit about TPM2 is uh, DOD, new computer assets, procured to support DOD will, will include a TPM version 1.2 or higher and required with DISA STIGs. Uh, those are standards. Uh, I don't even remember what STIGs stand for anymore, but it's a, it's a governmental security configuration standards. And they're pretty good, actually. They're good standards. Uh, and it, they apply to government systems. So in some government systems, they're mandated. So if you're going to use uh, systems in the DOD, you're probably going to need TPM or have it installed. I have TPM on mine. Do you have TPM? I don't know. So, yeah. yeah. Most of our most of our laptops have TPM. Uh, all right. So the kernel. That's the heart. That's the core. That's the operating system. This is where the reference monitor lives. This is like the big deal with operating systems. Usually running at ring zero, always essentially running at ring zero. Uh, interface between the operating system and the hardware, there's two different types of kernels mentioned here. One's monolithic and one's microkernel. The monolithic kernel, anytime I make a significant system change or I make a, hard, uh, a hardware change, I, I may have to recompile the kernel right, to load the new drivers into the kernel. Whereas a microkernel, um, it's modular. right? I can add new things without having to recompile. Windows systems are microkernels. Uh, some, like Linux systems, you know, sometimes I do need to recompile the kernel. Sometimes it's a combination of microkernel and monolithic. So there's kind of hybrid ones too. Got it with monolithic and, and microkernel. This is a pretty good diagram of the reference monitor uh, in the kernel. So the reference monitor is not the kernel, and the kernel is not the reference monitor. The kernel is a part, or the reference monitor is a part of the kernel. It's a core function, mediates all access between subjects and objects. So if there's a, like I said, if there's a bug in the kernel or a bug in the reference monitor code of the kernel, that's going to be a problem. Uh, always enabled, cannot be bypassed. So this is kind of cool because it's got subjects and objects. You see that everything has to flow through the reference monitor. It also needs to reference an authorization database to determine in whatever that database happens to be, mm -hmm. if it's an access control matrix or list, it needs to reference to make sure that I can do those things. And then there needs to be an audit trail. This also ties us back to uh, day one, right? When we talked about identity, 
authentication, authorization, and auditing. All those things are built in, sort of. Authentication, not, not explicitly here, but assume that it is. Part of the subjects piece would be also authentication. That's all there. File permissions, Unix people, anybody? Unix people, yeah, it's easy. So Unix are three types of permissions, right? There's read, write, and execute, and it's owner, group, and world. So you'll see uh, an example here. So there's an ls minus, or ls minus la. So at the command prompt, or at the, uh, hello, not command prompt, what's the word I'm looking for, shell. ls minus al would give you a printout like this, and you can see d is for directory. So it's a directory or it's a file. Uh, read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. The ones that have dashes are permissions you don't have or that don't apply. So the owner, usually it's, you know, read, write, execute all the way through, but you can see it. Uh, there's a file over there at that deny, which doesn't have those permissions. So the operating system. Uh, the group permissions and then the world permissions. So when I said world writable, uh, the middle one was a W, meaning that um, it's world writable. Those are areas of concern typically in any Unix system, except for places where it's by design. You require the application to enforce permissions. Cool. NTFS is different. Uh, read, write, execute, read, write, and execute are there, but now we combine read and execute. Uh, modify and in full control. We've all seen this, right? Right click on, select permissions, and here we are. That's what you get. That's it. You made it through. It was painful. I tried to go as fast as I possibly could. I didn't want to spend a lot of time elaborating, but now we have plenty of time for questions. Any questions on that? Portion, we went through 70 some odd slides in an hour and a half. So it was a lot and it was fast, but I wanted to get through it because it's painful, this this particular class, I think. Next class, oh no, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, next class, I get jazzed about, man, because it's encryption. We get to talk about history, we get to talk about wars that were won, different types of encryption, it's all math. I'm not a hard, you know, hardware guy, not so much, and the model stuff, it's boring. Yeah, the best question online tonight was, how in the world does everyone remember all this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> and now you get it. That is memorization lots of, tips. Lots of notes. Memorization tips. Cards. The way I passed the exam, truly. Uh, and a lot of the content, I passed the exam in like 2003. Some, yeah. Uh, so 14 <clears throat> years, the content, that, that whole part is the same. And every time I have to read the damn slides. Because every time I purge it, so like tomorrow, gone. But the way I prepared for the exam is I read the book. I didn't take any classes. I didn't go anywhere. I read the book once. I had no idea what I was reading. It was all German to me. I read the book the second time, and the concepts started to come out, right? I still wasn't master. I didn't master it by any means, but the concepts I understood. Because the first time you get so con if I if I know that I'm just going through it just to blow through it, I'm not – I'm not spending a lot of time getting frustrated with the fact that I don't understand what I'm reading. The second time, I'm just trying to put concepts together. And then the third time, I tried to master it. So that's how I studied. It took me three times to memorize. Yep. Yeah, it's just going to be repetition. Yeah, I did. And don't give up, though, because seriously, you and I can do it. I would be clearly anyone. Right. You no, know, I read through. I have a crappy, crappy memory. I read through the Sean Harris and I took notes on the legal bag and I went through the legal bags. Mm -hmm. And then read through uh, the Eric Conrad book. And then I just did practice tests. Yeah. And I think it's important to sit through a full 250 because. Oh, yeah, I probably like practice tests. Yeah, I did do that too. I think that was probably the biggest thing is okay, how do I score? Now I, go, I know what to go back and really but the good, on. But the good thing about this book too is, Got you know. It. When I, this is another example of uh, just finding a quiet spot to really focus. I passed the series seven. I don't know if you ever, you guys ever, yeah, I passed the series seven when I was in uh, like in college and 
I just locked myself. I took a, like almost a whole summer and locked myself in a library and just in one of those study rooms every day. Cause I really want, cause I, I want, I was really motivated by money. Then I wanted to be a stockbroker cause I thought you could just, this was wall street days. Oh yeah, man, I was going to be so rich. But then I realized, you know, when I passed my series seven, then I became a, I became a stockbroker, but I was a uh, hundred cold calls a day, straight commission. And every lead that I got or anything that went to a, another broker. So I was, I ended up just kind of building their book. But anyway, this series seven was the same way. I, I, it's kind of the same way. If you just focus, memorize. Now I don't know anything about. It. I'm. You, you, you don't want to trust me with any with a dime of your money. That's why you have a CFO. I was gonna say that's what you want to hear the president of the company say. You do, I don't. I, I don't do finances here. No. Kevin does finances. That's how we end up with go karts. That's how we end up with go karts. <laughs> well, Kevin's on vacation. Uh, test. Oh, so I was. So the question is, how many online uh, tests did Brad take? I use the free practice test that our site where they can do the user submission questions, and I probably Let's see if we can find. Gosh, I probably did. What are all these questions? Yeah, paychecks? Um, just in full tests. But I also didn't stop taking tests until I was consistent with getting 90% better, better results. Yeah, I was a little. But I didn't have the support network you guys have to understand where I was at. Uh, so. Here we go. I think this is the one that comes with the book. And then there's. Yeah, there's some other ones that I used uh, just to get as many. As many oh, I don't, I don't have the ones that came with the book. You have to have flash. There's ones. Flash. Uh, there's one. Ask I, him, I put it in the chat. Ask my already. security guy to install flash. <laughs> Not my computer. Yeah. I don't know. I can't, believe I'm I can't believe I'm installing Flash in front of all of you in a security class. There is a link to two, 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 two fifty question. Yep, that's probably easy. Seems like it's, uh, yep, that's it. It's in there. So yeah, well, it's that's the way I used as well. There's a link or a URL. In the now we've become um, three. <laughs> what am I looking at? Let me put a letter on it. Oh, you guys can't see what I'm doing. That's awesome. I'm installing Flash. You don't want to see me install Flash, do you? I was going to show the practice exam and finding it. Yeah, Flash player. Let's do it. <laughs> Whose computer is this? It's the marketing. Shall I allow Adobe to install updates? Why not? <laughs> yeah, encryption was tonight. Oh, look. So oh, tic tac toe. What's that? You thought encryption was tonight? Yeah. It is It is Tuesday night. And I, I love encryption. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We, we, can do some, we, can, we can do some encryption. Who's winning? Oh, nope. he got shut down. We can do some encryption. Uh, we can do some, we can encrypt some stuff too. You can apply. Like, yeah. No, I, I was just going to ask a question. From the original, in their assets, they had like a list of you know, seven, eight different ones, but you had come up with a model of three. <laughs> and it was, what was it? Say it again, I'm sorry. Assets? Assets? Mm -hmm. Asset classifications? Mm -hmm. Oh, typically I apply three asset classifications. It's confidential, internal use only, and public. No, not that one. It was... No, um, no it wants me to restart my computer. What is it? Oh, physical, software, and data. Yeah. Yeah. It says, pre oh, okay. I thought it said, please restart your computer, but it says, please restart your browser. Hey. Vandalism. This is vandalism. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, I bet you I know how to do. Wait. What does that do? I must have left the meeting in an accident right there. That would have been. Yeah. All right. You want to see the practice exam? Should we do some practice exams? We got a little bit of time left. I mean, 
Mama says we ain't got to be home yet. I ain't going home yet. I got to leave for Atlanta tomorrow morning. What? My, my grandson, my first grandson might be born on Saturday. That's the due date. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. And my son doesn't know that I'm coming. He, he just think he just thinks uh, he just thinks mom's coming. Cause he thinks dad's too busy. Yeah, so I'm really excited to see him. He's in the army. He's uh, um, at uh, Camp Benning in Columbus. All right. He's still telling me that Flash Seven. Let's find another. Let's find another practice exam. Oh, it's really. That's a, there's one from McGraw Hill too. Is there? Yeah. Yeah, because this will give us some stuff. Yeah, that one. This one? Yep. Paste that one as well. All right. Oh, but okay. Is this just about access control? Uh. Well, oh, you have all the different domains. We got to get the crap off there. Yeah. Rob, delete the stuff. Should we? Think so. There's Rob again. Well, well played, friend. Good game out there tonight. What do you want to do? Which one? You want to do cryptography? Use the, the old domains. Well, we can pick any one you want. Even though we've covered some of these, you want to do one that we've covered? Or do you want to do a new one? Let's do tonight's. Let's do tonight's. What is tonight's? What do we, what do we talk about? This one? All right, let's begin quiz number one. Z. Z. Z is Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Does anybody do anything with a flash? Seriously? Really? Oh, that's, this is all marketing. Is it marketing? It's marketing Let's see what I've got here. Who needs flash? I hate flash. Right. Let's try again. What's that? Oh, no. I was just talking to my brother last night, and there was a video that he was asked to install Flash to you on his Mac, work Mac, actually. And afterwards, he ended up with a couple of applications that were undesirable. Yeah. Flash, flash sucks. What do you actually, most <laughs> things from Adobe. <laughs> What? Actually, most things from Adobe, I think. Yeah. Awesome. I was in. Uh, I was in. Uh, what? True, but you still better keep it updated. Yeah. But what? Um, yeah. All right. Let's try this one. The following companies have paid to get licensed access to the quiz engine. Is that free? Is that free practice? Yes, is that where you are? Yeah, so that one requires a subscription. It does? Yeah, but it that's one I used. It was absolutely worth it. They have thousands of questions. I have to register. So which one is that? It's free practice test. Oh, How much? Um, 50 bucks. It's like, it's like yeah, for 30 days. Yeah, 50 bucks for I, I 50 bucks. I for bucks. It was absolutely worth it. Yeah, I've been using another thing. Still trying to find a practice exam. I would say on that free, we'll talk about it in the very last class. I'm sure it's real good. Once you're like that last month or two right before you're ready to take it, I would I take the subscription and just did a full test basically. It's like every day. I'll have to buy one. There's a lot of stuff. 
You're taking off? Have a good night. All right. Yep, what? Oh, thank you. Right. So right now what we're doing is we're just trying to find a price practice exam. I know. That's weird. I got it to work on mine. You got it to work on yours? Yeah. You have flash. Wow, yeah, yeah, whatever. Boards up. Uh, next year, screen. Uh, that's true. Oh, you're not on the screen. No. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.